Good afternoon. I'm Di Xia, Chief of the Crystallography Section in the Laboratory of Cell Biology at National Cancer Institute. Uh, I was told to remind the audience uh, to turn off your uh, cell phones during the talk. It is my great pr privilege to welcome and to be introducing today's world's speaker, Dr. Zhu Chen. Dr. Chen is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences of Purdue University and an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Dr. Chen was not born in this country. He came here as an undergraduate student after graduating from Ohio University in Athens in 1993, she joined the laboratory of late Don Wiley's at Harvard to pursue a doctoral degree. After that, she did her postdoc training initially in Wiley's lab and then in Flow Cultures Lab in Houston, Texas, before joined the faculty of Purdue University. <clears throat> there, she moved up the rank rapidly, receiving tenure in 2007 and becoming full professor in 2011. In 2008, she was selected to be the first HHMI investigator at Purdue. She is also a pure scholar in biomedical sciences. Dr. Chen is an expert in protein crystallography and her research focuses on ABC transporters, which are ubiquitous membrane proteins that import and export a bewildering variety of molecules across the cellular membrane. In prokaryotes, these proteins are critical survival factors. The bacterium E. coli, for example, has more than 80 different ABC transporters on board. Humans have 48 different ABC transporters and more than a dozen genetic diseases have been linked to the defects in these transporters. ABC transporters are also central to multi-drug multi resistance in bacteria, fungi, and tumors. Thus, ABC transporters are a compelling class of proteins, both for their medical relevance and for basic membrane biology. Dr. Chen used the models transported from E. coli as the model system to understand ABC transporters for more than 30 decades. Scientists had stacked up data that give them an excellent idea of what the models ABC transporter should be doing, yet it is Dr. Chen's work that produced detailed pictures of transporters in action. With her success in models transporter, Dr. Sun is extending her investigation into ABC exporters, of which less is known about their mechanism of function, such as substrate recognition and coupling of ATP hydrolysis to substrate translocation. More recently, her lab determined the crystal structure of a multi-drug transporter P-glycoprotein from C. elegans. P-glycoprotein confers multi-drug resistance in cancer cells. It also affects absorption, distribution, and the clearance of drugs unrelated to cancer and of xenobiotics. And today, we are in for a visual treat of one of the nature's most intricate machines in action. And Dr. Chen, we appreciate your taking the time to come here to deliver the lecture. So the title of the talk is Structural and the Magnetic Studies of ABC Transporters, Nature's Favorite Pumps. And please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Chen. Well, thank you for the invitation, Michael and Dee, and thank you for the wonderful um, introduction. It's really my honor to be here to give, in, uh, to give this lecture. So Dee just gave a very nice introduction was, uh, about the ABC transporters. I'd like to point out, actually the field, nowadays we have uh, probably more than 2,000 different ABC transporters identified from prokaryotes all the way to human. And, but 
The field actually started in the early 80s by the realization that two prokaryotic importers, maltose transport and histidine transporter, share sequence similarity to a human protein, multi drug transporter, P glycoprotein, which was first cloned here at NIH in Michael Gottman's lab. So, the realization that both uh, those group of proteins have the special um, sequence that's able to bind and hydrolyze ATP comes with uh, the name of the family. So, ABC stands for ATP binding cassette. So, nowadays we know all ABC transporters including exporters and importers com uh, are composed of two transmembrane domains. They can be homodimers or heterodimers. They form the transmembrane pathway for different substrates. Uh, and also have two copies of intracellular or cytoplasmic ATP binding cassette. And this again can be homodimers or heterodimers. So, all the members of the family share this architecture. Uh, so, this is for historical reasons, the maltose transport of E. coli has been studied for more than a decade, for more than uh, 50 years now as a model system to understand the ABC transporters. So, this is a picture taken in a 1981, all the people from uh, more than 70 people from all over the world come together to talk about this one transporter. So, if we can find such a picture for P glycoprotein, my bet is this picture will be even more crowded. So, what is a maltose transporter? A uh, maltose transporter is an importer that will bring in maltodextrins into the cell to support the bacterial growth. In the pyroplasmic space, it has, a mem it has a binding protein, we call it maltose binding protein, will interact with the substrate with high affinity and undergo a conformational change from open to the closed conformation. And in the pyroplasmic membrane, uh, in, in, there has a two transmembrane subunit called the MALF and the MALG, uh, together with two trans, uh, two ATPA subunit called the MALK. So, there are two um, major events happening in the ABC transporter cycle. One of them is the chemical event of ATP hydrolysis. The other event is a mechanical event of, uh, of uh, conformational change. So, transporters work by what we call the alternating access model, which was originally uh, proposed by Jadeski in 1966. So, this is the picture from uh, Jadeski's very short nature paper, but it captures the essence of transporter. So, for a transporter to be able to bring a substrate across its chemical gradients, it, um, Jadeski proposed it has to alternate between two basic conformations. In each conformation, the internal draw, the internal substrate binding site were exposed to one side of the membrane and one side of the membrane only. So, by alternating between those two conformations, the transporter can bring the substrate across the membrane. So, the most interesting question of course for the family is how does those two events, a chemical event of ATP hydrolysis and a mechanical event of conformational change are coupled. So, uh, there are two uh, key biochemical evidence I have to present before we talk about the structure of the maltose transporter. The first data coming from Amy Davison, when she first uh, reconstituted the maltose transporter into proteoliposomes. So, this uh, what she noticed is the transporter has a very low basal ATPase activity and the titrating in the substrate maltose did not really do much. Or, you, if you just add in the binding protein without the substrate, you have very low level of a stimulation. So, only when she add in binding protein together with maltose, she can see robust stimulation in the ATPase activity. So, this is a very important uh, result because it shows the interactions of the maltose binding protein in the paraplasmic side of the membrane will regulate the ATPase activity of the transporter on the other side of the membrane. So, a signal has to be transduced across the membrane to regulate the ATPase activity. Nowadays, it is a common uh, observation now, AT, a, the ATPase activity of ABC transporters are often regulated by the presence of substrate. And this is a way for cells to save 
energy if the substrate is uh, if the substrate is absent. So when I first started to study the transport, I was thinking maybe we should stabilize the transport in one particular conformational state for crystallization. So Amy suggests me use vanadate. Vanadate is a known uh, inhibitor of ABC transporters. So when uh, indeed when I test the vanadate effect on, on the maltose transporter, it inhibits both the ATPase hydrolysis, ATP hydrolysis, and the maltose transporter. Um, but also there is something very interesting I observed. So when we um, this is a simple poor down experiment. When I add a histidine tag to the C terminals of MALK, I can pull down all three components of the transporter. So this is the two copies of MALK, the ATPase component, and the MALF is one of the transmembrane component, and the MALG is the other transmembrane component. But when I incubate the complex with vanadate and ATP, something very strange happened. There is additional band, which turned out to be MBP, I can never get rid of. So what this tells us is that when vanadate traps the transporter in what we call the transition state for ATP hydrolysis, the transporter changes its affinity towards the binding protein. It becomes a very high affinity complex. All, three comp all four components form a very stable complex. So I thought this will be a good way to crystallize it. Um, so how do we trap a catalytic intermediate of this compound? So here is the basic uh, mechanism for ATP hydrolysis. Um, this in the ground state, ATP will bind a catalytic base, will polarize the water and uh, form the pentocovalent transition state complex. Under these conditions, ATP will be hydrolyzed to become ADP and a phosphate. So to trap this intermediate, there are several ways we can do. One is we can make a mutation and it will form a protonated form of this base. So with this mutation, ATP will bind with high affinity but not being able to uh, hydrolyze it. Alternatively, there are metal complexes such as vanadate or aluminum fluoride will mimic the pentacovalent uh, complex of the ATP doing hydrolysis and trap the complex. So we did it multiple ways and uh, um, bottom line is with all, all the different methods to trap the transition state give the, this one structure which is shown here. So here is the membrane component of the transporter. Blue and the yellow are the two transmembrane subunits, MALF and the MALG. Purple here is the maltose binding protein. And on the other side of the membrane, the green and the red are the two ATPase component of MALK. And uh, um, the most interesting thing we want to focus on about this complex is the transport the substrate maltose and the, the ad ligand ATP. So first let's look at the ATP. So in this complex, two ATPs are trapped at the interface between the two MALK subunits. So we call this a closed MALK, a closed dimer with two ATPs right at the interface simultaneously interacting with both subunits. So a detailed um, map view will see in this conformation, ATP is sandwiched between the Walker A, Walker B motif of one subunit and the LSGGQ motif, which we call the signature motif for ABC transporters since they are highly conserved in ABC transporters. So ATP simultaneously binding to both sides of the, uh, of the, of the dimer and it's positioned perfectly for hydrolysis. So in this conformation, ATP is ready to be hydrolyzed. So where is the substrate? The substrate maltose is supposed to be delivered by the maltose binding protein. And through the work of Flo Kiocho, my postdoctor mentor, we know maltose binding has two major conformations. In the presence of substrate, it forms a closed conformation where maltose is bound between the two lobes of MBP. In the absence of the substrate, the two lobes are in the more open conformation. So um, and we call this the open, open um, conformation and the binding with the substrate will be the closed conformation. So in this complex, 
the binding protein MBP is trapped in the open conformation. And where is the substrate? Uh, the substrate is no longer bound with MBP. Instead, it's delivered into the transmembrane subunit. And here's the density for, the, for maltose, together with uh, several water molecules mediating interactions between the substrate and the transmembrane proteins. And here, I outline a pocket formed at the interface between MALF, MALG, and the binding protein. So this pocket uh, is, is large enough to accompany the longest sugar, which will be seven glucose. And uh, it's, it's sort of occluded from the membrane and from the paraplasmic space. So maltose will not be able to escape back. So this will, by this way, in this um, conformation, basically the protein trapped the substrate inside the membrane. It has no way to go back. And we think this is important to make sure maltose will go transported in one direction instead of escaping back to the paraplasmic space. So uh, what does this structure represent in, uh, in the context of alternating axis model? So this is a slab view. We just take a 15 angstrom slab across the protein, and now you can clearly see the, bind, the binding pocket for maltose. And this pocket is open to the paraplasmic side, but capped by the binding protein. So we interpreted this structure as the outward facing conformation, where the substrate is binding side is facing outside, facing the paraplasmic space. So here, instead of open to the paraplasmic space, it's actually capped by the binding protein. And this capture by the binding protein is important because we know the affinity of the binding side for substrate is quite low. Um, so, in, so this will be important to make sure the substrate will not escape back. So the, the other conformation, the inward facing conformation, we were able to um, obtain the crystals in the absence of binding protein and, and any nucleotide. So this is a low resolution structure, but nevertheless, you can see the basic architecture. The maltose binding site now is facing inside the cell, connected to the cytoplasm. And the two MALK subunits no longer talking, contact each other. So it forms what we call the open dimer. So when we put those two structures next to each other, we can basically capture the two basic conformations in a transport cycle. An inward facing conformation with the two nucleotide binding domains uh, open, uh, separated from each other and the binding side facing inside the cell. And the outward facing conformation where the uh, well, the maltose binding site is facing MBP, and the two um, ATPs are sandwiched in what we call the closed dimer of MALK. So it turns out the transition between the inward facing conformation to the outward facing conformation requires not only ATP, but also the binding protein. So this is um, basically the data from Amy Davidson's lab when she wants to understand what, take, what does the binding protein really do to stimulate ATP hydrolysis. What she has done is she put the spin labels at the two MBDs inside the, uh, in, inside the cell on MALK. And by, seeing the, by measuring whether there is spin-spin interactions of those two spins, she can, she can distinguish uh, inward-facing open dimer with the outward-facing um, closed dimer. And basically what her data shows is if you take the resting state inward-facing transporter Adding ATP, it does not cause any conformational change. Only in the presence of both binding, maltose binding protein and ATP, we can form the outward facing conformation. So this shows the interaction of the binding protein with the transporter is going to do something to the transporter. And uh, we try to understand that by basically determining the structure of what we call the pre-translocation state. So this structure is obtained in the presence of binding protein with high concentrations of sugar. 
and also in the absence of a nucleotide, uh, nucleotides, no ATP or ADP. So we call this the pre-translocation state. Then you can see the binding protein is in the closed conformation with the substrate still binds to it. And we can also see the binding site inside the membrane because we had high concentrations of maltose. So we also see maltose bond here. But we believe this, uh, rep this structure actually represents the pre-translocation before maltose is being delivered to this site because this, this binding site has much higher affinity uh, in comparison to the, to the transmembrane binding site. So with all these structures, what can we learn about the system? What kind of mechanistic questions can we address? So first, uh, we like to see the structural details of alternating access um, model. Here we present three structures. An inward facing structure, we also uh, believe it represents what we call the resting state because it has very low ATPase activity and the substrate is absent. Then we also present an uh, outward facing structure conformation where maltose is already delivered from the binding site from MBP into the membrane and the two ATPs are being positioned at the dimer interface ready to be hydrolyzed. And then we present also an intermediate between the outward, inward facing and outward facing state, we call the pre-translocation state, which represents the initial contact of the, of the binding protein with the transporter. So when we analyze the structural changes between those conformations, they are small local conformational changes, but globally, the conformational change can describe as rigid body rotations of the two transmembrane domains and the two nucleotide binding domains. I should point out, Malkade is, has two, do, each Malkade has two domains, subdomains. Uh, uh, N-terminal nucleotide binding domain will hydrolyze, bind and hydrolyze ATP, and the C-terminal regulatory domain will interacting with other regulatory proteins. So in doing this transition, the two nucleotide binding domains will rotate inwards to each other, and the two MBDs will, uh, the two transmembrane domains will also rotate. So this is the transition between the inward facing resting state and the pre-translocation state induced by binding protein. And uh, this is the transition between the pre-translocation state where maltose is still bind here towards the outward facing state where maltose is being delivered into the membrane. Then you can see the, um, uh, the two lobes of MBP opened up to release maltose and the two transmembrane domains will rotate to receive the maltose and the two MBDs will rotate further inward so they can bind and hydrolyze the ATP. So when you look at this movie, pretty much all protein-protein interface are changing except for two places. One place is at the C terminal, the regulatory domain interface of MALK dimer is maintained in this transition. And the other, inter other interface is across what we call the P2 loop. This is a large paraplasmic binder loop from the MALF subunit with MBP. So this interface is maintained and this interface is maintained. So we like to test whether this uh, crystallographically observed conformational change is true in, uh, in solution during a transporter cycle. Again, this is a work from Amy Davison. What she did is she decided to cross-link the regulatory domain, which we know will, um, will maintain its interface during the transporter cycle by two cysteines. So uh, under oxidation conditions, the dimer, if almost 100% of MALK form a dimer. So those two um, regulatory domains are cross-linked. And the cross-linked transporter works just fine. So this means in the transporter cycle in, in lipids, the two regulatory domains do not need to uh, dissociate, just as we see in the crystal structures. We also test the P2, the interface between the P2 domain and the MBP, which is in the pyroplasmic uh, space. And uh, by doing also cross-linking, we can, we can cross-link MBP with MALF 100%. And this cross-linked um, transporter, uh, again, function just fine. So in contrast, 
if we put the cross-linkers at, uh, at the protein-protein interface that's supposed to change, we see something totally different. So one example is uh, you can see here valine 230 uh, with valine to, uh, 442 between mal G and mal F coming together form what we believe be, uh, form the paraplasmic gate in the inward facing uh, conformation. And if we mutate those two residues into cysteines and we can cross link, this, um, this transport will spontaneously actually cross link the two mal, the mal F and the mal G will, will be, become uh, one band, be cross linked. So the cross linked um, transporter can no longer function because the transition from the inward facing structure to the pre-translocation structure, then further towards the outward facing structure will require the two molecules, the two uh, amino acids to be separated. So they opened up the paraplasmic gate so maltose can be delivered here. So under oxidation conditions, the cross-link the transporter no longer function, but if we put the DTT inside, it will work just fine. So those are just some biochemical uh, experiments we've done to validate the conformational change we observed in our crystal structures. So the next question we'd like to address is, I mentioned for ABC transporters, it's very common that this, the presence of the substrate will turn on the ATPase activity. Um, and uh, and uh, through when the binding protein, for binding protein dependent importers such as maltose transporter, it's the presence of the maltose binding protein together with the maltose that will stimulate the ATPase activity. So how is that achieved? So by comparing the structure of the resting state, the transporter in the absence of um, any substrate, and together with the transporter that's been stabilized by, by the binding protein, we can see the interaction of the binding protein will cause global conformational change of the, subs, uh, of the transporter. Number one, so you first immediately notice this P2 domain, which is absent in the inward facing structure, become organized and interact with the binding protein. We believe in this conformation, the P2 domain probably is quite flexible. It's moving around like a receptor. Once it's it finds the binding protein, it will help to bring the binding protein towards the transporter to form this initial complex. But more importantly, the interaction of the binding protein with the transporter will cause rotation of the transmembrane domains. And you can see that by comparing the transmembrane binding site in the inward facing structure without the binding protein with the one with binding protein, now we change from inward facing binding site to an occluded site. So the two subunits rotated relatively towards each other and close this end. This rotation will bring the two nucleotide binding domains, which is docked onto those two subunits, close to each other. And it will be close enough. Now ATP binding will complete the transition to the outward facing state. So this is a, a, close, a closer up view of the three conformations uh, regarding to the ATP binding site. So this is the uh, um, Walker A motif and histidine 192 that we know will interact with ATP. So in the absence of any binding protein, in the open dimer conformation of MALK, the Walker A motif, the ATP binding motif is not in contact with any residues in the other, other side of the, um, in the other subunits, so they are separated from each other. But the interaction of the binding protein with the transporter will cause the NBDs to rotate inwards. Now in this configuration, those residues are actually making hydrogen bonding with the second, um, with the second NBD. So now the two NBDs are start to communicate with each other. And in this configuration, if ATP comes over, it will further cause closure of this um, in a MALK interface, now we form the closed MALK where ATP is positioned and simultaneously interacting with both subunits. 
So in this close to confirmation, ATP I mentioned before, now is positioned and all the catalytic residues are in the right place to hydrolyze ATP. So only in the close to confirmation, ATP is able to be hydrolyzed. So by formation of this um, outward facing state, the molecules does two things. One is to transport so the bind, um, maltose from the binding protein into the membrane. The second thing is it will place ATP in the position to be hydrolyzed. So the reason only the closed dimer can hydrolyze ATP is actually an analogy to what we know as the um, arginine finger for a uh, uh, discovered in many other ATPase. This is an example for the F1 ATPase. Again, this is the Walker A motif of one subunit that will bind ATP, and it has all the catalytic residues able to hydrolyze ATP. However, it is not able to hydrolyze ATP in the absence of arginine finger, which will be supplied by another subunit. So the function of the arginine finger is to position the gamma phosphate so it will be able to be hydrolyzed. So here in the maltose transport, what we see is the functional role of the arginine finger can be replaced by what we call the signature motif of the A, uh, of ABC transporters, ALSGGQ motif. It does exactly the same thing as arginine finger. It positions the gamma phosphate to, to, hide, to be hydrolyzed. And we, um, test this hypothesis by experiment, kind of an unusual experiment, more or less by accident. Um, we took advantage of, we can form the pre-translocation state by two methods. One way is we just co-crystallize maltose binding protein, wild type binding protein with, with high concentrations of maltose. Another way we took approach is we put a, two cysteines that will cross-link and stabilize the binding protein in the close conformation. So we basically can lock the transporter in this pre-translocation state where the two MBDs are, are separated from each other. So we say, okay, let's now soak in ATP and see if there's only a local conformational change caused by ATP binding. That was the original goal for this experiment, but the result came out pretty surprisingly. So in the cross-link the MBP, when we prevent MBP from opening, we're soaking, um, this is a non-hydrolyzable ATP analog. What we see is we can see the crystals stay in the same conformation and we can see MP binding to the nucleotide, bind, uh, nucleotide binding site. But if we use the wild type MVP, we're soaking AMP, PMP. Actually, after we solved the structure, we were very surprised to see the conformational change we described before actually took place right in the crystal. And so MVPs opened up, and this, the whole transport uh, trans transition to the outward facing conformation. And the first thing, with first time we did this, we thought we messed up our sample. So we redid it three times. We had a whole prep, just have wild type MVP and did the whole soaking experiment. And again, every time, single time, we resorted to having this outward facing conformation. So we had a very special packing arrangement in our crystals. And this conformational change somehow didn't destroy it. So, but we also see something very interesting. So in this outward facing conformation, we can see nice densities for the entire AMP, PMP. So this experiment tells us, in this experiment, the AMP, PMP did not get hydrolyzed by accident. But if we look at the densities for the open, when the MBDs are separated from each other, we can only see density for ADP, not for the gamma phosphate. So when we look at this structure, we say, ha ha, the reason we don't see density for gamma phosphate is because the gamma phosphate is not in the right place, in one place, it's probably moving around. That's why it's, uh, there is ha have no density around it. And the reason the gamma phosphate is moving around is because the LSGGQ loop is not in place to position it. And we went back to the literature to compare. There are many uh, high resolution structures with isolated MBD with the ATP bond. 
So when we superposition those structures, the, the, uh, the position for ADP superimposed very well, but the position for the gamma phosphate is actually in very different places from structure to structure. So this actually reinforce uh, only in the closed conformation, closed dimer conformation, the presence of LSGGQ will position the gamma phosphate for hydrolysis. So this again explains why the, um, why the open MBD uh, dimer has very low um, basal ATPase activity. So one more slide about ATP hydrolysis. So uh, doing ATP hydrolysis, the conformation of ATP actually changes. So in the ground state, uh, the gamma phosphate form the tetrahedral conformation. And when water is polarized and attacking the gamma phosphate, it will go through the transition state, which is what, what we call the trigonal bipyramidal. Basically, those four um, atoms, phosphate and the three, three oxygens from one plane. Then on each plane, on each side, we'll have an oxygen. One is the bridging oxygen from ADP. The other one is the uh, attacking uh, water, the oxygen from the attacking water. So this is a very special structure, and it's the transition state for ATP hydrolysis. So in the field, people wonder whether the transition from the tet tetrahedral conformation to the transition state will cause any global conformation change for, uh, for the protein. Um, so here we address that question by basically crystallize, determine the high, high, con uh, high resolution structure of the transporter in, the, in, um, in, 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 in complex with nucleotides will either mimic the ground state or the transition state. So here is the density for the ground state. This is probably this is determined by the AMP PMP. You can see the nice um, uh, tetrahedral structure of the gamma phosphate in this conformation. But when we trap the transition state with uh, with either aluminum fluoride or or vanadate, we can see the conformation is at the global conformation for the structure didn't change. And but now you can see the nice. Um, trigonal by pyramidal density for the gamma phosphate and the water is positioned to t attack phosphate. So this basically tells us for ABC, tra uh, ABC transporters, the formation of the transition state for hydrolysis uh, do not cause any global conformational change for the protein. It's merely a chemical step for hydrolysis. So, so the next question we'd like to address is how does ATP hydrolysis enable substrate transporter? So the most, of course, the straightforward way is we would like to determine the structure of the post hydrolysis state to see what, what happens to the protein after hydrolysis, uh, which we were not successful, and I believe there is a reason. The reason is if you look at the structure of the outward facing state, the, the, the dimer, the open closed dimer is basically linked together for the gamma phosphate. And uh, so you can imagine after ATP hydrolysis, this bond is going to break. And then after release of the inorganic phosphate, this dimer is no longer to be stable. So it will open up. So likely form what we believe is uh, probably will be very similar to the pre-translocation state. When you open up the MBD dimer, you will cause rotation of the transmembrane the domains, but then you will force the MBBs to close. But this time, the, the substrate maltose is already delivered to the, to the membrane side. So MBP will have to close in the absence of the substrate, which we know is very, is energetically un unfavorable. So in this case, I think this complex will quickly relax into the inward facing uh, conformation where MBP will dissociate and find another maltose to interact with. So, and from um, studies of EPR and the other, um, and the isolated MBDs, we know after ATP hydrolysis, the two MBDs will open up. So, for, based on those evidence we propose, this is the basic hydrolysis cycle. Basically, the substrate binding and the ATP binding will induce the outward facing state where maltose will be delivered into the membrane and ATP will be ready to be hydrolyzed. 
then the energy from ATP hydrolysis will, will complete the, the transport cycle by bringing it all the way back to the inward facing state where the substrate will be dissociated into the membrane, uh, in, inside the cell. So, um, so this is our understanding of the transport cycle. And then, so once we know um, how the ABC transporter works, the natural question is can we regulate its activity? It turns out that nature has already come up with a solution, at least for the E. coli maltose transporter. So, so this uh, is related to what we know as carbon catabolic uh, repression. It turns out maltose is not E. coli's favorite sugar. It's, um, it, so from the energetic point of view, there are certain uh, carbon hydrates were preferred by E. coli because it will be quickly me metabolized. So in the presence of those carbon hydrates, what E. coli will do is suppress the expression and the transport activities of all other carbon hydrates. And the, this, this phenomenon now regulates about 5 to 10 percent of total E. coli gene. And in E. coli, this, is, um, this regulation is being, regulate, is being um, achieved through one protein called the uh, 2A. The E2A, the enzyme 2A of the glucose transporter, part of the PTS system, which is so well started here at NIH as well. So in the absence of a preferred sugar like glucose, E2A will mostly in the phosphorylated state. And the phosphorylated E2A will turn on cyclic AMP synthesis, which will in terms turn on a lot of CCR sensitive genes, which will encode transporters and enzymes will uptake and metabolize other carbon source. But when glucose is present, it will be transported into the system through the PTS system and it's simultaneously being phosphorylated. And the phosphate is originated from PEP through a cascade of reaction. And the, as an intermediate of this reaction, now E2A will be shifted from a phosphorylated state to a dephosphorylated state. Now the dephosphorylated E2A will go ahead and block the activities of a number of sugar transporters, which includes the LAC-Y transporter will pick up lactose and the maltose transporter, and it also inhibits glycerol uh, metabolism by interacting with glycerol kinase. So, so the question is how does E2A do it? Um, Oh, okay, one more, one more thing I want to point out is by physically blocking the, ac uh, the activities of those transporters, E2A actually does two things. One is it will prevent immediate uptake of these sugars. Another thing is actually will downregulate the expression of all the genes that will um, that will enable transport and metabolism of those sugars because those carbon hydrates turned out to be the inducers of its own opera. The best study the system we all learn is the lactose, or the lac opera. So um, in the absence of any lactose, E. coli does not want to waste energy to make enzymes that will uh, break down lactose. So what happens is there is a repressor will bind to the operator, will prevent expression of the whole lac opera. So when lactose is available in the media, it will be transported into the cell by lac-Y, the permease. And the isoform of lactose will interact with the repressor. And this interaction will block the binding of repressor to the operator. Now RNA polymerase will, will bind and go ahead and make genes that will um, enable lactose uptake and breakdown. So maltose work very similarly, except that it works through an activator we call the MALT. So activation of the mal operon, all the genes that will enable maltose transport and the breakdown, is under regulation of MALT, but also require the presence of maltose. So by uh, so when E2A prevents um, maltose transporter, it will also downregulate the expression of um, of all the mal operon. 
So E2A as a central regulating molecule in the system has been studied for many years through many laboratories, in many laboratories. So through their work, we know E2A is a small molecule with 168 residues. It has two regions, an N-terminal flexible region and a major core re, uh, structure which looks like this. So we know phosphorylation, neither phosphorylation or, or interactions with other molecules will change the conformation of E2A. The structure of E2A with its uh, downstream and upstream partners as well as glycerol kinase are all determined. And uh, they show actually E2A use a common surface interacting with all those different molecules. And the one com which is uh, painted yellow here. And uh, all of this, uh, this interface involved the histidine 90 which is known as the uh, phosphorylation site for E2A. So we like to know how E2A in the dephosphorylated form will, will inhibit the, mal the activity of the maltose transporter. And we we'll approach this by determining the structure of the transporter together with E2A. And this is what it looks like. So this is the complex. And the maltose transporter is um, in its what we know as the inward facing resting state. And we see two E2A molecules which are shown in purple here bind to the MALK subunits. And uh, before our structures, actually there were many um, Genetics data has already identified mutations in the maltose transporter will escape E2A interaction. And when we look at the, well, the locations of those mutations which are shown in a green and the yellow box here, they're all located at the interface uh, with E2A. So this gives us confidence about the, accura uh, of the pr uh, accuracy of this complex. Also, the histidine 90, the site of phosphorylation, is again right at the interface. It actually forms a hydrogen bonding with the MALK subunit. So this, gives, this explains why phosphorylation of this histidine will, um, will become, will, in, will dissociate, um, will make this complex unstable. So this, this interface is, um, is not compatible with the phosphorylated E2A. So only in the dephosphorylated form, E2A will bind the maltose transporter and inhibit its, uh, its function. So, so how does E2A inhibit the maltose transporter? Now if we review what the transporter has to do enable, to enable maltose uptake, basically the rigid body rotations, the key uh, involves the transmembrane domains and the NBDs. Now we have two E2A molecules come and bind into the MALK subunits. And every, each E2A simultaneously interacting with the regulatory domain of one subunit uh, and the NBD domain of the other subunit. So it basically locks the transporter in this inward facing state. Now the NBDs can no longer rotate in to form the outward facing state. So basically E2A is an allosteric inhibitor. It prevents maltose uptake and ATP hydrolysis by preventing the conformational change. This transport has to go through to do these things. So another interesting thing about E2A is actually by the observation, uh, naturally it has these two, conf uh, two um, Forms. One is a full length E2A, uh, the other one is a truncated E2A without the N terminal sequence. And when, you, when people study how E2A functions, they notice the truncated version of E2A has no problem interacting with the soluble partners. However, it's, they are deficient in interacting with transmembrane um, subunits. So, so in our crystal structure, we had the full length E2A, but we only see residues from 19 afterwards. So when you look at the position of the first residue we see, they are pointing right towards the membrane. And actually it was um, Maria Klor uh, many years ago has proposed this idea. Maybe this N-terminal region, although most people don't see in structures, has an important function. They may, they may function as a membrane anchor to bring E2A to the membrane surface to, to enable, to enhance its interaction with transporters. 
NMR structures determined of the peptide at the N-terminal region shows it forms a helix with all the hydrophobic residues lining on one, one surface of the, of the helix. So also suggesting this might be the function for the, C, uh, for the N-terminal region. So we test this um, hypothesis by a very simple experiment. So what we did is we reconstitute our transporter into what we call the nano disk. So it's a, like a membrane disk with the transporter embedded to that. Then we can add MBP and the maltose from one side and the E2A and the ATP on the other side. Then we monitor the ability of the E2A to inhibit ATPase hydrolysis. So with the full length E2A, we can achieve about 90% inhibition with the here coefficient of, uh, about 1.5. So this is consistent with we need two E2As to bind to the transporter. And uh, with the truncated version of E2A, we also can inhibit, but it takes a lot more protein. So now the IC50 is, um, is 90, almost, almost 100 micromolar in comparison to 1.6. So this, the only difference between those two experiments is the presence of the N-terminal region. So this supports the idea that the N-terminal region of the E2A functions a membrane anchor. So with that, I'm going to summarize what we have learned about this system. So the maltose transporter function through alternating access uh, mechanism. So in the absence of any uh, substrate, the, the, the transporter resting in the inward facing conformation with its two MBDs separate from each other, so it will not waste ATP. The presence of the binding pr um, substrate will stabilize the binding protein in the closed conformation and the close conformation uh, binding protein will interact with the transporter, uh, cause, um, bring the two MBDs close to each other, close enough, now ATP binding will, co will convert the transporter to the outward facing state, where maltose is delivered into the membrane and the ATP is ready to be hydrolyzed. ATP hydrolysis will revert the transporter to the inward facing state, at the same time release the maltose into the cell. So when the preferred sugar, such as glucose, is present in the media, it will be transported through the PTS system. The enzyme 2A of the glucose um, transporter system will become dephosphorylated, and dephosphorylated E2A will interact with the maltose transporter, stabilize it in the inward facing state. Now, binding protein and the ATP can no longer initiate the ATPs, the, the transporter cycle. I should also point out, in E. coli, only the glucose-specific E2A will, um, will do the regulation for the carbon catabolic uh, repression. However, any PTS sugar, so we, there are probably about 20 of them, any uptaking of the PTS sugar will drain the, will consume the phosphate the P, from the same PEP pool. So by doing that, it will change the balance between the phosphorylated and dephosphorylated form of the glucose specific E2A. So any, the presence of any PTS sugar will enable inducer exclusion through this mechanism. So with that, I need to thank people who did the work. Mike Oden is a permanent scientist in my lab. He determined the two crystal structures, both the outward facing state and the pre-translocation state. Sun Xuan Chen is a graduate student in my lab who just completed the structure of the E2A inhibited transporter. Diraj uh, is my first postdoc uh, who I did, uh, determined the inward facing structure. And this has been a long term collaboration with Amy Davison. And uh, continuous funding from NIH was extremely important for this project, as well as uh, later funding from Pew, a AHA, and uh, HHMI. Thank you for your attention. Sure, G is happy to answer some of your questions. Well, it's a really beautiful work. Congratulations. Thank you. And the question is really um, specificity 
of the periplasmic delivery system. The, now the MBP delivery motors will activate in the ATPase. However, there are a lot of binding proteins in the periplasmic. Yeah. And so how the specificity is enforced. Okay. Prediction is the ATP binding actually strengthens, has a role, not just the opening or closing, inward, outward, actually play a role in specificity. So well, by specific specificity, you mean the, for the transport the substrate? Exactly. Yeah. So for the maltose system, we actually know precisely. I didn't have uh, time to talk about it. So what's known is the specificity of maltose transporter is mostly enforced by the binding protein. So this system transport um, linear link the glucose from two glucose to seven glucose with alpha one four lineage, so it's very specific. But so maltose binding protein selectively binds those sugar. But we also know some sugar or some uh, will bind the maltose binding protein but cannot be transported. So by work I didn't have time to talk about. We now know what happens is the sugar has a polarity. It has a reducing end and a non-reducing end. Maltose binding protein will bind the sugar at the at the reducing end and the transporter will bind the sugar from the non-reducing end. So basically the sugar will channel from the binding protein into the membrane and both sides are restricted. So the substrate specificity for the maltose system is reinforced by both the binding protein and the transmembrane subunits. Yeah, that's very nice. However, does ATP play a role in selectivity? ATP has no role in, uh, sure. in selectivity. Yeah, that's clear. It's most, mostly just it's like the engine driving the system going. Uh, if that's the case, the question is also the protein interface between more K and the more F and more G, the transmembrane portion. Yeah. From your diagram, the interface changes at different state. So it's not a, a, just a rigid lever mechanical motion, there's more into it. Yes, yeah. So, so she asked about the, what about the interface between the transmembrane subunits and the NBDs. So what we see is the NBDs have a pretty hydrophobic um, cliff on the surface and the, the transmembrane domains have a helix coming out, basically lie inside this, um, this cliff. Okay, we, we call this a uh, ball in the sucker. So doing different conformational changes, basically this ball from the transmembrane domain will rotate inside the cliff. And the one side of the cliff is quite flexible, it can adjust its size. So by doing that, it will enable different conformational changes but still maintain the close contact. And they are salt bridges at a certain, uh, certain positions is also critically linked. So there are certain fixed connection and then certain flexibilities. By doing that, it's able to maintain high affinity but also allow relative motion in different conformations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for an interesting talk, uh, taking us through the whole transport cycle of this transporter. Um, I have a question regarding the inward uh, facing conformation and outward facing conformation. So if I understand it correctly, if you have uh, the ATP hydrolyze at the uh, ATP binding pocket, that doesn't necessarily bring a conformation change which will be going from an inward to an out, uh, from an outward to an inward facing conformation. That's correct, yeah. Um, so you need to have both the substrate and the ATP present at the same time. Precisely. Uh, so what would be the next step after this? How, how will be the sequence of event? The ATP will release first, uh, which will change in the, bring in the change in the affinity of the transporter. I mean, I'm asking this question in regards to the export pumps where yeah. you have a change in the affinity. But what will bring a change in the affinity on the substrate binding side? Sorry, I don't quite understand the question. You mean what will happen after ATP is bound in the outward facing state? Yeah. So we know ATP will be hydrolyzed. We already see the formation of the transition state of hydrolysis. Then so the bond between a, a ADP and the phosphate will be broken. Then what happens is pretty much we know for sure the inorganic phosphate will be released. Then, uh, then um, 
whether it's the release of the inorganic phosphate alone or the release of the inorganic phosphate plus ADP to open up the dimer, we still don't know that detail. Yeah. So the, to capture in two different conformation, you basically need uh, both ATP and the substrate, or you don't have any of them, then it will change the, the conformation from outward to inward facing. So from the, so okay, the way I see this is, there is two basic conformations, the inward facing conformation and outward facing conformation. There is an energy barrier in between, okay. In the forward cycle, the energy barrier is overcome by the binding energy from both the substrate and the ATP. So you need the substrate to bind and ATP to bind, now you can go to the outward facing state. Once it reaches the outward facing state, it has no choice but hydrolyze ATP because ATP is positioned perfectly to be hydrolyzed. Then the hydrolysis, the energy from ATP hydrolysis will bring it back to the inward facing state. Substrate does nothing in this reverse uh, cycle, but now by reversing the cycle, we now expose the substrate into the cytoplasm now, and the binding site has very low affinity for the substrate. Once it's connected be into the cell, it will be diffused out and be metabolized. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, before I um, ask the last question, I want to make an announcement. There is the reception after um, the Q&A uh, sponsored by FAAS. Please come and join us. So my question is, um, you didn't mention um, the, uh, the lipid um, effect on the, on the conformation of your protein. In your C. elegans PGP <laughs> structure, uh, the, the, the effect is tremendous. So any comments on that? Yeah, so um, functional-wise, maltose transport doesn't seem to care whether lipid is there or what lipid is present. It's a pretty robust engine. But the structurally, we do see at least the one lipid always bound to a certain position on the peripheral of the transporter. It fits into a surface depression between two transmembrane helices and it became part of the structure. So in different conformations, we always see the same lipid. So you can imagine this become part of the structure. So maybe stabilize the transport. It's being co-purified with the transporter, yeah. Let's thank Dr. Chen again for her excellent lecture.